Hello, everyone, and welcome to our ninth episode here of the Echelon Cycling Podcast, where we go into depth of the cycling week that has gone before. Today, I'm unfortunately only, well, not unfortunately, uh, always <laughs> a joy being joined by Patrick, uh, our do cycling creator, but we have no Ewan with us today, unfortunately. He's stuck in transit. But yeah, um, I mean, Patrick, it's not like we have nothing to talk about. We have... <laughs> Water Catalonia, Get Wevelgem, E3 Halbecker, Copy of Bartolis, the stage race, and uh, plenty of other one day races as well. Yeah, where do you want to start? <laughs> uh, I think let's start in Belgium because it just, it, I think like it's the most exciting stuff. I think that's where the, the cycling world is really focusing in now, considering that we're a week away from Flanders right now. And uh, it's really crept up on us, on us all. But I think, yeah, let's start with E3. Because I think that was kind of the main show, but of course it was eventually taken out by by Wout van Aert. You know, spoiler alert. But if you haven't watched it, then that's that's, that's on you. But I think it, it was predictable in a strange way because Pogaccio, van der Poel, and Wout van Aert all sort of rode away from everyone, and that was sort of a predictable move, but something which I don't think everybody was particularly expecting to happen. It's worth noting of Wout van Aert probably didn't well, he didn't seem like the strongest on the day. But he still managed to pull out a, a victory, and that could be because he's he was riding a bit more with a bit more racecraft. Perhaps usually we see White Art riding on the front a lot. Perhaps not being the smartest racer, but he did a really good job this time round and backed himself in a sprint against Matthew Van der Poel. And you know, I think we were all thinking, "Oh God, we're getting flashbacks to Flanders when Van der Poel just won again." Pogaccio was unfortunately, you know, he's really good, but he was always going to struggle in a sprint against those guys. I think Wout did a really good job, but I think it's worth noting that Jumbo Visma weren't that great, and to be honest with you, in, uh, in, in E3, considering the dominance which we've had in the likes of uh, an Omloop and a Kern Brussels Kern, it was quite surprising to see that Wout Van Aert was quite isolated, and somebody like Christophe Laporte, for example, who obviously came into his own today, wasn't there and it, I think that was quite surprising or like a Dylan Van Baal either so White Man Out was definitely quite flying solo and I think he did a really good job to uh, to take out the victory there in E3 were you quite surprised at White won do you think it was Van der Poel who was probably going to win he looked strongest yeah I mean we've spoken about that uh, that peak match of Van der Poel is better than and then White Van Aert seems to kind of just freeze every time he's up against the Dutchman but like this because he is a better sprinter on paper like we all know this but it's like he forgets it in the the pointy end of these big races so I think he really needed this victory like for his own confidence as well Tadej Bogaccio was there much of Van der Poel like you said I was surprised for sure. I'm not going to pretend that I thought he was going to win. I I definitely thought much of Vanderpool had it given the the cyclocross world championships and the whole season as well. But yeah, I mean, many people will be annoyed that it's another Jumbo Visma victory. I mean, we had, we're not going to speak about Japan really, but they nearly won that as well. With all of Koi Philipson was the one who managed to ride really well in that one. But this sets up Flanders really well as well, don't you think? Yeah, I think it absolutely does. I think those three are definitely the, you'll see those at the top of the bookies list, that's for sure. And the way with Flanders is that usually the favourites do tend to win. I think the last kind of person who was kind of more unexpected was perhaps Betty or maybe in 2019 or something, but he even showed good flashes of form. It is the people who are in good form right now who tend to do quite well. It's rare that somebody will just come out of the blue and, and take the victory. And it wouldn't surprise me if those three ended up in the exact same scenario next Sunday to be honest with you however it's going to be like an hour of extra racing like an extra 50 odd kilometers or so and you know Pogaccia was really putting the hammer down on the order Quermont and that only took place one time in E3 and it's you know going to be there a lot more times and White Manar was suffering on the order Quermont just on that one time so you know Pogaccia could be the reason that White Manar ends up you know, not being there, just because he seems to favour, or and he said in his interviews that he favours the Arda Quermont because it's a bit longer and it's a bit more suited to him because it's the longer effort. So I reckon it's all going to go down on there and I think it'll be an absolutely cracking race next Sunday. I really can't split the difference between any of them right now. I really think that any one of those three could win it right now, but I'm sure that, um, you know, we'll be doing previews or whatever. <laughs> so you'll just have to tune in or whatever. I mean, we should, we should try and make the case for Wout Van Aert winning. He's never won Ronde van Vlaanderen. We know he's finished second, but yeah. how does he win it? 
I think we both think they have the strongest team. They've shown that with, we haven't even talked about Ghent Wevergem yet, but they have all the team players that they need. You've got De La Porte, you've got Nathan Van Hoendoink. You, yeah, like the team is just insane. Tis Benut, we haven't talked about. Dylan Van Baal, it's like the second place finisher of last year's Ronde van Lander and winner of Paru Bay. So, I mean, yeah. It teammates yeah. is that a, a thing that you really need and the finale of a tour of flanders is not really something we're used to seeing teams having teammates in that like last 20 30k i think the teammates would certainly help but you, you might end up in a weird scenario where dylan van baal or van hoyd on Laporte, etc is up for road and therefore they need to get brought back by we're presuming pigatra and vanderpol but if you end up in a scenario where it's like well we want out to win but but now we've got our guy up the road and he's not getting brought back. So then you're like, oh, no, what do we do? Because now we need Wout to win, but he's stuck here. I think that Wout needs to just kind of play it like he did with E3. Um, he, he did it there. Just try and do something similar as much as as much as much you can. Hopefully his teammates, I think, will be there and to be able to protect him, especially when you consider that Alperson looked a lot stronger than I think a lot of people were expecting at E3. You know, Cern Kral was a, a big factor in that race for van der Poel and was part of a reason why van der Poel was such a strong contender late into the race i think that wout can certainly win flanders but it's going to require i reckon it'll probably be like a, a sprint kind of style thing i reckon that i don't know it's hard to say he could very much kind of rock up and just drop people on the climbs but he just didn't quite have that get up and go at e3 i reckon that if he can just kind of hang with and just kind of Go, go with Van der Poel and Pog, but I reckon he could beat him in a sprint, and especially with that mental factor that he's just beaten Van der Poel, he could certainly go into that sprint with a lot more confidence. I mean, we might as well join Gem Wevelgem in here to some respect. Uh, mm. That race was absolutely horrible. The the torrential rain, everything was just you wouldn't want to cycle your bike in that weather. But there, like, well, we know Wat Van Aert has won that race before. We know last year. Uh, Christophe Laporte looked like he was going to take everyone was thinking he was going to win I think uh, apart from Vinium Gamay which was good for him but <laughs> and and good for Eritrea blah 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 what happened on Get Wimbledon was basically like we hit the Kemmelberg for the second time and Wat Van Aert and Laporte just rode away from everyone else and uh, this destructive force yeah and then they went on to win by more than two minutes and handed the victory to uh, Laporte which I think was a huge gesture and first French winner since 1997 and all that but I mean the form that Wal Van Aert has he even rode away from Laporte on the final Kemmelberg uh, ascent but like waited up for his teammate but it's just the frustrating part there was we didn't have the comparison with what much of Underpool could he have hung on there Tadabagacha like they are just three riders in a league of their own right now yeah literally I think that the almost the more the most impressive part about Gen Bevelgum is that this isn't some new strategy by Jumbo Visma that we haven't seen before this has been done multiple times now think back to Paranese last year think back to the tall stage that finished in Calais last year think back to just all the kind of one two kind of attacks that we've done this year in all the races it's just it's not new it's just that people can't fight it it's so hard to overcome like Wout van Aert when he's backed up by his team as well and like you're saying you know he was weighing up for Laporte as well he is literally just in a league of his own with with van der Poel and Pogac and yeah it would have been nice to perhaps have them there especially since they're not doing Dwyer's Doors even on the provisional start list, that is. Perhaps they're just wanting a bit more of a rest period going into Flanders, probably. We'll have to wait and see. I think that, yeah, it was great to see. Like, Wout Van is just, he was just literally the strongest guy there today. And when you compound that with the cold weather and like the cold and wet, it just makes it even more, even more deadly. But the thing is, it's not even like an advantage that he has over a Van der Poel or Pogaccio because they both also ride well in the cold and wet conditions so it's kind of like just it's all still just a stalemate but it just depends if yeah can Yuma Visma get you know can Laporte go with the punches can can Van Baal be there at Flanders to kind of ease the pressure on on Wout and put the pressure on to Pogaccia and Van der Poel I reckon if they could do for sure but I reckon Wout Van Aert's certainly going to be um He's going to be a, a much more confident man going into Flanders next weekend, do you reckon? Completely. I think Tadu Gacha and Macho Van Apple looked at the weather forecast for getting well with him and thought, nah. Yeah, nah. Well, that's the thing, like, you know, by riding that race, 
cold and wet. You know, it is possible that riders get ill off of that. And they, they, you know, Pagatra and Van der Poel just thought, you know what, I don't want to take that risk. Yeah, that's very true. But do, would you back what we're not to win Ronde van Vlaanderen next week? Oh, um, what back him over Van I mean, der Poel? I mean, gotcha. yeah, he says he wants a big one this year, so. I feel like I'd definitely, I'd definitely back him over Pagatcha. Um, but it's just a Vanderpool effect. He is kind of the king of Flanders, like the Tour of Flanders, isn't he? He's just, I know he got beaten by Asgreen, but he, um, <laughs> he, he just knows how to do that race so well. He's really good when it's, he's really good on like a one-on-one sort of thing. But if Pagatcha's there as well, perhaps it complicates things a bit too much. I feel like. Given that he how he rode at E3, I reckon I've, I would back Wout to win Flanders next weekend. Yeah, I reckon I would. I mean, we'll have to wait and see. It should be very yeah. exciting. I can't wait. Yeah, literally one of the best races of the year. But uh, nevertheless, sticking with Gent Wevelgem, obviously, when you say Gent Wevelgem from now on, it's always going to be associated with uh, Binyam Gummai. We've had plenty of comments on all various different channels about concerned fans of Binyam Gummai saying, is he on the wrong team? What's going wrong with Binny? What is happening with Binny? And uh, yeah, I think we should just address that here because I think Binny is such a superstar for the sport. There's no no qualms about that. And get well again, unfortunately, it was terrible weather. He did say in an interview as well, he doesn't like those conditions. Like this again, well again, was complete contrast to last year, which I think was very sunny. He also had a strange crash early on as well. And uh, yeah, so it's just terrible day. I'm I'm completely impressed that anyone stayed on that bike that day. That weren't from the Northern Europe. And yeah, Navajas was up in, in the second group on the road. That was quite yeah. impressive. But uh, yeah, what is happening with Binyam Gamay? We've we've He's mm-hmm. taken a victory already this year. We saw him up there in Terreno Adriatico, but everyone's going to be comparing it to his incredible performance last year, not only in E3, but of course in Gamay in this part of the season. He set a very high bar last year, perhaps a, a bar that's kind of like above average. And, you know, it's just that people thinking that Binny isn't doing as well as last year means that he's not doing good. It's like he's still doing fine. It's just that he's not like crazy high up here. He's just like normal. And you have to remember that the season doesn't end at the end of March. Like, you know, there's so much more time. You know, you, people will be rejoicing come July or something if Binny wins a couple of stages of a tour it's very easy that the season can turn around and that maybe it's just that he has a bit more of a target on his back considering that he yeah, did exactly. so good last year yeah like he did so good now he doesn't have that surprise factor anymore he's just like he can't just kind of slip off the front whereas last year in Ghent bevel gun people were kind of like oh you know like you were probably like oh laporte will be, he'll beat Binny, like whatever it's kind of like it, it'll be fine yeah he doesn't have that surprise factor i don't think it's the team like we saw intermarche they, they are a good team i don't reckon it's the, i don't think it's the team that's that's the problem i reckon it's just bike racing comes down to look sometimes or, or just the, the legs that you have on the day and you know what maybe just the things haven't fallen Binny's way so far i don't think it's anything to be concerned about he's only 22 as well i mean yeah the team are developing around him as well they brought in mike Chunis and they're like restructuring around he's going to be the face of the team for many years and as he is only so young like i know we are in this freak period of cycling where you we have like 21 year old tour de france winners and whatever but like Binny. He his trajectory is gonna be amazing. Let's be honest, because well, this season as well, we've got the Flan- Tour of Flanders is coming up. He's gonna do Paro Bay for the first time, I think, in his career, and uh, Amstel Gold, which we both kind of said that that profile fits very well with Vinny. It's just it's so hard. Like I, I don't wanna be like say like he's not good, but th- there is just kind of the match of Van der Poel, Van Aert, and Pagacha level, and it's kind of just. In a week, I just don't think Binny's going to turn that round. It's just it's just a natural thing of things. It's just kind of the preparation hasn't quite gone right or something like that. It's just the way it is. But does that mean that he's not going to do well in other races? No. I reckon, like we said, Amstel, I think, fits him perfectly. It's quite attritional, but usually ends in some kind of small sprint between a couple of people or a bit of a group. And I reckon that's just perfect for Binny. Absolutely perfect. Kind of similar to when his Giro, to his Giro win uh, last year. I think that Binny is... Uh, He's not done for this season. He is yeah. gonna get. He's gonna do the well. Tour. Yeah, the Tour de France yeah, the as tour. well. 
There's yeah. plenty of things to come. He he's such a young rider. He could still line up at the Total Avenir. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine wins GC at Lavernia or something. That'd be crazy. I reckon B- Binny's going to do good things this this season. It's just maybe not going to be in the next couple of weeks. Maybe it might just be a little bit later. I don't know. We just need time to let him develop, and then he'll be this. Well, he's already a superstar, but the, exactly. that upper echelon. Well, much of Annapol and what we're not are not twenty two years old. So yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. Have patience, people. It'll be fine. Don't worry. Yeah, but uh, Binny we'll, fans. Yeah, with that, um, moving on. Uh, well, actually, in the Gent Weber game, there was a bit of a controversy as well. Or was it Idri? Uh, Idri, where I don't know if you saw it, where uh, Wat Van Aert, he got his chain ah, yeah. moved. And there was a lot of mentions to the case we talked about, the Faulkner case, that the inconsistency of the UCI, that they they didn't penalize him, but they penalized her. Mm. But uh, yeah. It's an odd one, isn't it? Because by the by the rule book, yes, he should have been disqualified. You know, when he went back to the team car, it's kinda of like, oh, you know, he just wants his chain to not be squeaky. And it's like, yeah, but you know, he's getting the bike held and the chain loops going on. And I'm like, it's just a little sneaky strategy that's been in cycling for decades, isn't it? It's just uh it should be probably clamped down on more seriously than it is. I'm not sure if it's just because I, mean, I don't want to be rude to Kristen Faulkner, but Wout Van Aert was kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of Wout Van Aert. I feel like if we disqualify him, then that's no good. Kind of like Ghana at San Juan when he did that illegal position and he wasn't DQ'd. It's like, is it because they're in like a... Well, then Faulkner was in a winning position. I was going to say, it's be- is it because Faulkner wasn't in a winning position? No, she was. She was very close to winning. Was and for, It's like if you DQ'd Wout Van Aert at that point with 5Ks to go. Commissaire comes up alongside says you're DQ'd. You know, is that's not great for the race, is it? Because yeah. then all of a sudden you remove a player and that influences the, the final result of a race. Does it make more sense to penalise the rider afterwards? Probably, because then it doesn't influence the race. But then it's so hard because then it's just people start taking the piss, don't they? Yeah. And doing illegal things when they're... Well, illegal. Things that are against the rules. It's hard to, to tell. Um, I reckon... In that case, like maybe just a slap on the wrist, UCI points and a fine's all right. But I reckon if they do, if he does it again at Flanders next weekend, it's going to be uproar. There will be like you'll see, I'll, you'll see teams being like, "What's this? You can't tell me that's okay." Yeah, I always think when this UCI inconsistencies with rules, okay, it's not, it's probably not fair to compare the Super Sapiens thing to this. It's two different things, but. Uh, the under twenty three in Yorkshire, the winner of that race, he Acof. got disqualified. Yeah, yeah, Acof got disqualified. the cars, and yeah, which like, everybody does. Yeah, it's like it now's the sense. time you're clamping down on it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, the UCI is just so inconsistent. I don't really know how you fix this problem. Whether it's do the same commissaires because obviously the same commissaires probably don't get set sent to all the races is it just a matter of judgment like personal opinion do some of them think that's fine some of them think that's not fine there just needs to be more consistency to be honest with you i think that's what cycling fans and races and teams want is just listen we just need to know where the line is because i reckon some people are straying past it some people don't want to go near it and i think it just needs to be set out in black and white yeah i completely agree but uh moving on to more happier topics catalonia the race that is kind of sometimes seen as the crossover between tour de france favorites and the giro d'italia favorites here we certainly had the two favorites well you would say the two favorites remco venipol the current world champion and Primoz Roglic, the two last Welta Espana champions as well, really crossing swords here. And I must admit, it's some of the best racing I've seen between two riders in a very long time. Yeah, it was unbelievably close. And I know that Roglic took it out in the end, but it was by six seconds, which, yeah, I know we've won, but it's good to see that they're really close in terms of level of kind of favourite status going into the Giro I think it's it was great to see that they were on a similar level because it means that going into the Giro there's still that speculation going on it would be a shame I think if one of them took a victory over the other by say two minutes and then it was just kind of like well this person is now guaranteed the favorite that's it Giro's over maybe nobody's heard bothers don't start 
Roglic has won or Avon Apples won already. So it was great to see just continuous, continuous battling all the way on to the final stage where they ended up winning by like a minute over Soler and people like that. They were really just in another league, kind of similar to what's been going on with the classics as well. But it was so brilliant to see just two brilliant climbers just at the top of their game. And, you know, they didn't even need a TT as either. Like there was no TT in the race either to influence the, the results or make it one way or the other. I reckon Avonapool's just a smidgen better at a TT, I reckon. Going from what the Vuelta was like last year, where he put a bit of time into Roglic. Brilliant race in terms of the battle between those two. Obviously, it wasn't close between them and third. But uh, yeah, great going into the Giro. I can't wait to see what's going to happen, especially since uh, Sudal Quickstep really lined up with their Giro kind of it was like a dress rehearsal wasn't it really if we go by numbers Primoz Roglic took the first stage then on the second stage into Valta somehow Ciccone managed to out sprint both oh, yeah. of them Remco Venepoel then wins on the third stage then Caden Groves he won two stages Roglic wins on stage five and then you're like ah okay it's in Roglic's corner but then as you said on the final stage in Barcelona on that crazy hilly profile yeah they were kind of just distancing everyone and then I think yeah, that ended up uh, Guillaume Martin actually lost the KOM jersey. Oh, wait. Yeah, he did. Yeah, so that was a bit of a shame. But yeah, so Eventable won the polka dot and the Young Riders. Roglic obviously wins overall, and he definitely let Remco win. He, well, he, won, he let him win without any contest at the end because he knew he was uh, going to yeah. be winning anyway. Because Remco was so annoyed at him. He was worried he was going to clatter him. If he didn't let him win or something. <laughs> Remco was not happy, was he? Yeah. Because, I don't know, I have this theory, but it's just, Remco's so used to, well, not used to, he usually kind of just rides away from people when he's in like his kind of top form. You know, with Ever well to last year, I know that people were able to follow him, but he was dropping people when he really was like intent on it. And I don't know, maybe it was just that this was one of the first times where he's like, I'm in my top game. And I can't drop this guy. And it, maybe it was just mentally kind of getting to him, perhaps showing his uh, youthfulness a bit more. But I think that it was it was a good little bit of drama. But uh, Roglic was playing it smart. He wasn't biting. Like yeah, you said uh, he was very strong. He's very used to dropping people, but especially because it's like a one week stage race where he's normally like so clinical when he's on form. But you know, Roglic equally has one of the best one-week stage racing Palmarises in the peloton currently. So it's it was really a clash of junior versus senior to some respect. But yeah, do you think this is the best rivalry we we have right now in the sport? I know we have um, a match of Annapol, we have Wout Van Aert, uh, that rivalry, we have Pogaccia, Vingo, we actually have Pogaccia and Macho van der Poel, Pogaccia and uh, <laughs> Pogaccia. Roglic, but yeah, Pogaccia, Pogaccia and everyone. Versus, Pogaccia versus the Peloton. <laughs> um, is it the best rivalry? I reckon it's the best rivalry this week. <laughs> <laughs> Weekly rivalries. Weekly rivalry. It was the best one this week. Uh, best one in the sport? I don't know. I feel like the Van der Poel and Wout and Wout and Wout one yeah, just it's sure. got that uh, it's got that longevity. It's been going on for like a decade. I just feel like that's more the, the, probably. Yeah, probably is probably is more, isn't it? And I, I just said a decade because I couldn't think of when they started racing cyclocross since they were out of the womb. That was it, <laughs> just immediately. <laughs> I think that yeah, it's a good rivalry. It was the best rivalry this week. Um, I'd like. To, I reckon it could develop into a good one though. Like one of the best ones over the Giro, if this, uh, if it remains really level pegging and Remco gets a little bit more furious, I reckon it could be good. What do you reckon about some of the other riders? Mikael Landa turned into a meme, but uh, <laughs> he did. Yeah, I mean, looking at the top ten, well, we know the two, but Joao Almeida obviously going to the Giro. Mark Soler, I think he's going to the Giro, but he's going to be in support. Michael Woods. How did he get into that top 10? Uh, Ciccone going to the Giro, we think. Jad Hindley going to the Tour. Alto Brooks managing to get in ninth. That's pretty good. Rigoberto Ran. Yeah, I mean, Joao Almeida, he must be really annoyed about this. Two minutes and 11 seconds down on Roglic. Yeah, I know. You kind of see like, oh, Almeida finished third. But then you look at the time gap and you're like, oh, that's actually quite a bit. But to put it into the grand scheme of things, he's like, his goal is probably a podium. That Basically, that third spot of a podium considering that nobody gets ill and nobody crashes. He's probably thinking, okay, this third spot could be mine. I'm up against the Ineos Grenadiers, who haven't been looking that great recently. We'll get on to them. <laughs> we'll get on to that. Um, he's up against Blasov, 
and some other people who I can't quite think of to to mind. But that that just kind of goes to show like there's no massive people who I'm like immediately thinking of. Oh, this person will beat Almeida. He's been really close for quite a few years now, especially at the Giro. He's been get, been sent to that. I swear for like the last three years or something. Like ever since like that COVID edition where he really burst onto the scene. I think the Giro has always sort of been his goal. Or like what the UAE have set aside for him. But he's always just about finished off the podium. I reckon if he managed to take that off, maybe it would just be like, oh, right, move on, move on to something else. I think that, yeah, he could honestly, he could be the guy who finishes on that third place, especially considering that I probably haven't seen enough from the other podium contenders to really kind of warrant their status as being the third place provisional favourite. Yeah, true. Lazo has been a bit hit or miss lately, so... We could but, say that because Ewan's not here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ewan, Ewan would be all over <laughs> Blazo. His theory that he's going to be the he's the kryptonite to the Remco, but I think Primoz Roglic is doing pretty good at yeah, that, exactly. just keeping him in check. As we said, well, was this the race? I'm pretty sure it was. So we're still at the Catalonia. Yeah. yeah. So how different time makes things in a way that came out a bit weird, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, 2021, number one. Adam Yates, Ineos Grandes. Number two, Richie Porte, Ineos Grandes. Number three, Geraint Thomas, Ineos Grandes. Here we are, 2023, two years on. And there's zero Ineos Grenadiers riders in the top 15. The first one is Jonathan Castroviejo in 16th and Egan Bernal. We know crashed and abandoned. And we talked about Egan Bernal last week as well, how we were concerned about his future in the sport or if he was ever going to reach the heights of uh, his 2019-2021 performances. But yeah, Patrick, Ineos Grenadiers, what is going on with their their GC aspirations here? I don't know. I I was really hoping, I was very optimistic last week that we were going to be seeing a bit of a rejuvenated Bernal and I was quite looking forward to it. But I don't know. It's kind of like pains me to say. Why is it with Ineos leaders and crashing? Why does this keep happening? I don't know. I want to say that Bernal's kind of coming back, but it's just kind of like, how long is this sentence going to get rolled out? That, oh, he's, he's coming back. You know, he's just coming back from injury. It's like, yeah, but for how long? How long am I going to keep on rolling out this kind of like Trojan horse? Just like, it's going to be fine. It's fine. I don't really know. I wish I could tell you that it was going to be fine and Bernal's going to be flying again like next year but i honestly don't know in terms of their other gc aspirations like their other riders they've got i mean g to be honest with you i know that g hasn't really performed this year but garrett thomas never really performs outside of a warm-up race before a grand tour objective so like i expect him to probably do something like tour of the alps and then do well at the giro in last year he didn't do anything until like tour de suisse and then the tour like, it's not really like I'm worried about Garrett Thomas doing bad this time because it's just what he does right now. Like, he just targets Grand Tours really well. So I reckon G's still kind of like a bit of a watch out for him. But then there's like a Rensman kind of there, kind of not. I haven't seen, well, I mean, he wasn't at Catalonia, but he was like not looking that great at Torino. So that's a little bit concerning. There's the whole kind of Pidcock, maybe, maybe not, but he crashed in Torino. Coming back next week in Blah Balls, uh, no, Dwarves Doors, not Blah Balls Spell. But then, like, I don't even know who else. There's kind of, like, even, like, outside of their GC aspirations, H- Hater hasn't been looking that great this year either. I-, I just don't really know what's going on with Ineos. And Ben Turner crashed. It's just, like, I don't... Re- I'm trying to find some kind of silver lining. I know Ganna finished on the podium at San Remo, but... He crashed in Gen Wevelgem, and so did yeah. Mikhail Kielkowski. So yeah. they're having bad luck here. Like, t- tell me tell me where to feel optimistic. Because I'm just... I'm struggling. I am. Uh... Pavel Sivakov, ninth in Paris Nice. That's not really. This is a race that they've been winning for donkey's years. Yeah. Danny Martinez was nowhere there. Martinez is doing Basque Country. Won that last year. Maybe he could do something like that. They won Paris Roubaix last year. They seem like they're focusing more on the classics now. And yep. the Grand Tours are a nice to have because they know they can't defeat Jumbo. They can't defeat UAE. They can't defeat Remco. Uh, so like they're a bit stuffed in that department but i reckon they should sign it well you spoke about it as well that they're not this lucrative place now anymore for like young riders to develop that they yeah Ayuso, that would have been a rider that they should have had their clothes in but yeah. he went to uae 
they missed out uh, a few of the riders who went to Jumbo Visma as well. The the young, uh, no, well, there's quite a few no, young Norwegians <laughs> win them now, but yeah. there was one one particular that they missed out on. So it's like, yeah, they laughably tried to sign Brebko Venepol last year after the yeah. world to win. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. They could definitely afford him, but <laughs> yeah. I don't think he's leaving the Belgian outfit anytime soon. We're going to have our eyes on Tour de Lavenir this year, I reckon. <laughs> just like... They're... They've literally, no, literally, they've got to put, they've got to just kind of press their face up against the screen of Lavinier and just be looking for who's doing well. And they've just got to try. Like, basically, it's just, got to, it's just a matter of statistics. You've just got to keep <laughs> signing these young talents who are doing well at Tour de Lavinier and one of them will fall through. They will. It's just, it will happen. Tour de Lavinier is a pretty good predictor, right, at the end of the day. Like, you know, we've got, I mean, Bernal prior to crashing, Pagacha. Do Soler. I know he's not like a race winner, but he's still pretty decent. Vias Foss as well. Like it does produce good riders. It is a good predictor, and I reckon they've just got to try and get ahead and and try and beat other teams to the punch. Eitablux is another one who's won Lavenir last year, and you know it's not rocket science. It's like the winner usually does quite well. You're just got to try and market it to this young rider that hey we're in a rebuild you're going to get some good priority here because we've got quite an open kind of book in terms of being able to give you a bit of leadership because we don't have like the best leaders right now and you've got to try and market to them that way you've got to say if you go to freaking uae you're fifth in line like yeah it's true. gonna take you it's gonna take you years you're behind pagacha almeida ayuso automatically like mcnulty Soler, like you you've down the list and I reckon that's how they're gonna do it. They're gonna try and get young talent in from Tour de Lavenir and just all like the, the classics as well, like the under twenty three, Flanders, Roubaix, stuff like that. And just try and beat them and market it in the best way possible to those guys. Yeah, I think you're very, very right. Or, yeah. Out of Brooks would have been great. Like yeah. a great signing actually. They could just make a women's team. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> because for some they, reason they, they haven't done honest. that. They, they should loads of world tour men's teams have a women's team and they've got an under 23 team and Ineos have neither and their elite men's team still sucks it makes sense of that it doesn't i agree yeah yumbo has a development team this could definitely yeah, yeah. that could be one way they used to have the wiggins team which was like unofficially the a development yeah. team but i think they just use british cycling as their yeah. <laughs> but as we know british why, cycling why is in an absolute state so therefore what are you gonna do yeah, I mean, how do they get out of this rut? We were, yeah, if we focus on like the Giro, they are sent, as you said, they're going with G. Mm -hmm. But I mean, Garen Thomas is older. I know he's finished on the podium last year, but he hasn't got great synergy with the Giro, to be fair. Yeah. That plastic bottle in, where was yeah. it? Yeah, that was a very yeah. unfortunate crash. I, yeah. I to bike. <laughs> I feel like getting a guy in now would be great because you have someone like Gary Thomas still in the peloton and they could kind of, he could be a mentor for them. But it's like, who is that guy? Is it Aaronsman? Is it Tom Pickcock? Is it, uh, some people are talking about Tarling as well being this next Miguel Indurain, but who knows, he's only 18. So do you think this is going to be our season where there's not too many highlights? Well, Pickcock, phenomenal highlight, yeah. as we know. But like, do you think other than a Pitcock or maybe a stage here and there, it's going to be a great season? I don't reckon it will be. I, I I I hate to sound pessimistic, but I just don't really see where it's going to come from. You know, in the tour, it's just going to be hard because they don't really have a guy to go for GC. So therefore, what they need to do is really drop them out of GC pretty quickly and then go for breakaway stages. But, you know, are they going to be happy doing that? Is Ineos okay with doing that? They ca they have done it in the past with like, you know, Carapaz and uh, Kvikovsky, say, in a few years gone by. But I don't know whether they're going to be okay with just letting GC go, you know? <laughs> It feels like it's something which are like, no, we need to, we need to do GC. We can't let it go. Yeah, well, wait and see. We might be wrong. We were a bit wrong with our Jumbo Visma video when we were asking the questions there. And then the following <laughs> week, they showed us up by winning both of them. But uh, yeah, well, prove us wrong in your screen days. That's what we we're saying. But continuing on to Copia Bartoli stage race, Copy, Fausto Copia and uh, Gino Bartoli, absolutely two icons of the sport. And uh, yeah, the stage race in Italy, which is a really good little nifty stage race. They don't have live pictures of it, which is a bit annoying. Yeah, we've seen Jonas Vingegaard win here in the past. 
he won the stage race in 2021 so it could be a quite a good precursor but i mean patrick out of the limited data we have <laughs> like we what did you call it? what have you made of this year's edition it was just ef well went into this race and said how many riders can we get in the top 10 of gc at the end of this top they five said, you know, they're like have you heard of team gc before we're gonna win it but by the biggest margin you've ever seen it's cr- it was a crazy performance by ef you know sometimes they do go under the radar a bit but they absolutely just smashed it it was ridiculous i can't even name all of them but i know that ben healy he won a stage and then he went on to win the he won a one day race today didn't he but kind of like it's like the after party basically he kind of won that as well which is great for him because that he's going to the giro so he's clearly got a good bit of form right now but yeah ef i mean padun was there after a few years ago where he did those crazy dauphiné performances which everybody's still kind of living off we're kind of like is padun on his way back as well but EF just absolutely smashed it. I couldn't quite believe it. But there was also some great performances by like Quick Step. You know, there was like Cavania did really well, kind of with a couple of early moves, which he's very renowned for making, but very hard to bring back. Mauro Schmidt was there, really exciting rider. Can't wait to see what he's going to do in the future. I hope he kind of goes to the Ardennes or something. He could do really well in an Amstel as well. He's very, he's kind of Binny esque in a way, but without the sprint of Binny. I kind of that's kind of how I see him but that that was a great ride by him and it was kind of like those two teams who were really dominating things and then like that that's kind of what I took away from it and then Ineos got how many riders in the top five you're right with Ineos oh yeah Leo Hater so like if if we're looking to the future Leo Hater under 23 Giro champ Michael Leonard as well, finishing quite high up in the final time trial this 18 year old Canadian so maybe our previous segment was a bit too hard on them. Yeah, I mean, these are this is the silver lining that Ineos can take away is that, okay, they do have young talent. They, they absolutely do. It's just going to take time to develop these guys. I'm interested to see what Leonard's going to do for sure. I mean, of course, I don't know, 18 years old. You, you'll be thinking in like a few years' time, you'll be like, How, why hasn't this guy done anything? Oh, he's only 21. It's kind of like uh, like Marco Brenner in a way. There's been a lot of hype around him at DSM for a while, but these kind of youngsters get brought in very young, like 18. Not everybody's Avenable Ava or Pagaccia. It's crazy to maybe expect that from all of them, but that was a good silver lining with, like you say, Leo Hayter and, and Leonard. I think that they did, did some good time trials there. Of course, the Ineos equipment is very dialed in, so um, it's not like they did have the, the advantage, let's say, in terms of like their, their equipment, but still worthwhile noting that Ineos do have that young talent um, but they just need a few years just to as they say rebuild yeah that's very true yeah I think you're right I think Rome Kovenopo has kind of ruined cycling for a bit because he he was 18 and signed to skip the under 23 and so many other riders subsequently have done that but uh yeah James Shaw as well friend of the cycling day and he finished second it, it, it's so annoying I thought he was going to beat Mario Smith on the final time trial but uh yeah unfortunately the Swiss rider got the better of him just by two seconds so but I mean still a uh, podium and the top four three of them are EF education easy post riders but uh Domenico Pozzavivo also in sixth place I think that's quite True. a good result He's going to the Giro too, I think. Yeah, so... Um, Lots of time trials though. Yeah, <laughs> oh. I, yeah, that that is true. He's Maybe he can go for the polka dot jersey. Hey, there uh, you go. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it was a really good race and uh, Mara Smith even won the points classification as well. But anyways, now coming to the favourite part of the show and yeah, Patrick, who's your rider of the week? And I hope you're not going to say Ben Turner. Ben Turner did a did a pull. He was visible, so he he would be worthwhile picking. But I'm not going to pick him. Stay away from my bias. I'm actually going to pick Frederick Frieson for Lotto Destiny because he finished fourth in Bruges de Pau, and I think he also finished fourth in Gent Belgen, both in torrid conditions in the wet. And I think that it was a really underrated performance considering that everybody looks to Arno Dali and Caleb Ewan in Lotto Destiny to really be doing the business. Actually, Frederick Frieson, I think, really went under the radar this week. And, you know, going through those two rainy races and getting two fourth performances, you know, you just finish off the podium so you don't get the recognition. And I think that it's worthwhile just kind of shouting that out as, you know, good job because to get through those races. Did you know his uncle actually won the Game Game in 1990? Really? Yeah, I only oh. looked that up. I like, didn't know on that. The stream. 
I mean, am I gonna go biased? Am I gonna go James Shaw? Am I gonna go Mespil? No, I'm not gonna do that. I mean, I should. We should be picking what we're not like, but that seems too easy. And or Remco Venable or a certain Primus Roglic, but that also seems too easy. So I'm gonna go for hmm, Ben Healy for finishing up there in Copia Basile and then as you said winning the after party race uh, I think that's quite impressive by the Irish rider <laughs> uh, I think BC failed him hi everyone apologies I couldn't be in this week's episode but I'm still here to give my rider of the week and that goes to Primoz Roglic of Jumbo Visma. There's been so much pressure on his shoulders about how he's going to address Rimko Avenepoel, how he's going to sort of match up to the Belgian phenomenon at the Giro later this year, and also at Catalonia itself. And Roglic really rose to the occasion. After what's been a pretty difficult sort of six months, you would say, from the Buelta, that awful press release, all the way until now. And he's, I mean, we sort of forget about Roglic, but he's always there and he's still as he proved in Catalonia, one of the best stage racers in the world. So there we go. Pretty much rock glitch of Jumbo Visma. Anyways, that's it for our ninth episode of the Echelon Cycling Podcast. Can you believe it? Make sure to check out our Apple podcast, our Spotify, and what's the other one? Amazon. Amazon, yeah, I'm sure there's plenty of more. But yeah, comment down below, subscribe to the channel. We're trying to get a thousand. We've already hit past the 500. Thank you very much for watching, and we will see you next week. <laughs>